Let me greet those that are joining us online. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video or stream along with us. We're having a great time. I want to extend to you a personal invite to come and join us here at Believers. We are having a great time. This week, we're continuing on a series that we began last week called The Pursuit. The Pursuit. Uh, we touched on this topic because success is something that concerns me. I've seen more ministries, more ministers, more individuals struggle or crash and burn due to success than I have those that struggle. And I think that's in part because success becomes a destination. The pursuit and the, the underlying topic of what we want to discuss over the course of the, this week and uh, the weeks that will come is that success or a pursuit is a journey, not a destination. And last week we began the topic in, in the idea of every successful pursuit begins with a decision. So let me start by talking about the three things that hinder us, that keep us from making a decision. I know there's more, but there are three primary things that I think that hinder us from launching out. Number one, not to re-preach the whole message, but just to recap, the first thing I think that keeps us from making a decision is complexity. We overcomplicate it. So complexity is the enemy to execution. We need to stop focusing on step number two, three, five, ten, whatever you can think of, and just recognize that God wants us to take step number one. Let's not overcomplicate it. When we overcomplicate the, the, the decision, we actually find ourselves with the emotions of being overwhelmed. Fear enters, which is the second thing that keeps us from making a decision. Fear produces two possible responses. Number one, I'm either going to respond with an aggression, I'm going to fight, or I'm going to respond with a retreat, I'm going to flight. And what we need to do is have more respect, more awe, be further impressed with the goodness, the majesty, the largeness of our God than any inferior obstacle or mountain that we face. And the third thing that keeps us from making a quality decision is we need to have the right story. That is to say that we need to have the right internal dialect. If you tell yourself the wrong story, you'll never make the right decision. We, uh, we need to really divorce our old story and marry the truth. And that only happens by knowing God and knowing his scriptures. Without a secret place, there is no successful place. So decisions shape our destiny. And if you think back over your life, I'm confident that you can think of decisions that you made that dramatically altered the course of your life. Perhaps you, if you had thought differently or responded differently to that invite to a party, you maybe uh, wouldn't have met that spouse. Perhaps like me, if I hadn't responded to an invitation to a church service, I wouldn't have had that encounter with Jesus. There are decisions that we make that alter the course of our lives, both good and bad. Now let me talk on the, 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 the decisions that perhaps didn't work out the way you thought. Instead of focusing on the mistake or the miscalculation, let us begin to focus on what we learned. Because if we focus on what we learned, we can make an adjustment, we can change. You know, failure is not the result of a mistake or miscalculation. Failure is the result of quitting. So let's learn from it. If we don't learn from a mistake or a miscalculation, we're destined to go through it again. But if we grow through it, we don't have to go through it. I'm not a glutton for punishment. I'm sure you aren't either. So I want to grow. I want to learn. I want to adjust. So let me take a, a real dangerous, dangerous step and make an assumption. I know it's never safe to make an a, assumption, but let's say that you've made a decision for change. That is that you have decided that you want to go. You want to grow. You want to develop your skill your craft. You, you, you need to understand this one thing about making that decision. Change is not a matter of ability. Change is really a, a matter of motivation. A decision comes from information. I've been given better information. I now have an understanding or a revelation. So that's my decision making. But making change is really a, a, a result of being motivated. Last week, I talked about having a picture, an image of the outcome that you desire that's our why at the end of the journey. When I understand my why, it motivates me for the what. A strong why empowers my what. I'll go through this short-term discomfort to get to the outcome, the why. So let's talk about four things today that will motivate us and inspire us. I know there's more, but I want to tackle four today. 
So the first one, if you're taking notes, which I want to recommend that you jot these things down, it's very helpful for us to go back to. We, we need to know where we want to go. We need to know where we want to go. We do that by all the same process that we do when we take a journey. We need a map to go to a place that we've never been. Let's say, for example, you asked me today to leave here in Eagle, Michigan and drive to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Now, I've never been to Albuquerque, New Mexico, but I know enough about our geography to say that I'd have to head south, southwest. But there's a lot of territory if I were to begin to drive south, southwest. So I would need a map. A map will provide uh, information for me how to get from point A to point B. It'll tell me what interstate to take. It'll tell, tell me what uh, side roads or highways that I'll, I'll need to get from point A to point B. But a map is really general. It's going to get me there, but it's not specific. I've heard uh, an acronym used for the word Bible. Uh, perhaps you have too. The, the acronym is simply this. Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. The scriptures are general. Let me give you an example. We learn from the Apostle Paul's writing that if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. But it does not tell us what individual job or grace that we have. But it tells us that we need to work. It's general. A map is very busy. There's a lot of information there, but it doesn't give us specifics to the road, uh, the road conditions. It doesn't give us specifics to the kind of town or village that we're going to drive through. It doesn't tell us about the personalities of the towns or the diner that you're going to stop and eat, eat dinner at. But we have both the scriptures, the Bible, that is our general map to get us from point A to point B. But even better, we have the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus was having a discussion with his 12 disciples in preparation for him leaving the earth, and he knew that they would struggle. So he says, so he says to the guys, listen, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to leave, but it's better for you that I go. Now, I don't know about you, but I know for, in my mind, I thought, gosh, would it get any better than hanging out face to face with Jesus? And now Jesus is telling the 12 disciples, it's better that you go. What I'm going to send you, this helper, is going to be an upgrade. Let's look at John chapter 16 and verse number 13. We'll pick up on the conversation that Jesus is having. John 16, verse number 13 reads this way. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide. You're going to want to focus on that word guide. He'll guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you of things to come. The word guide there very specific in the original text. It means to guide or lead like guiding the blind. I'm in trouble without the, the guiding system of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit, I already mentioned, uh, is a upgrade. Instead of having God with us, it's God in us everywhere I go. That's amazing. That's a, that's a mind blow to me. To think about God of the universe, creator of all things, the one who spoke my existence is going to dwell inside of me. He's going to dwell inside of you. That's awesome. The Bible, I already said, was general. It says, my, my example with the Apostle Paul, if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. But it's the Holy Spirit's job that plunges you and I, baptizes us into our purpose, our plan, our specific call in life. The Holy Spirit is very direct and very specific with you and I. Now, I want to be careful not to, you know, cheapen what I'm about to say. So I'm going to stress, this is like, similar to. The Holy Spirit is similar to, it's like a GPS, now, be, I'm old enough to remember having to carry around a map uh, on paper or carry around a road atlas, depending on where I was going, to look for a direction. But as things advanced, technology advanced, uh, before everybody's phones had some form of GPS system on it, there was a device called a TomTom. -tom. I remember having one, and I, I got to say it saved my bacon one time on a trip to California. My first time to L.A., six lanes of traffic. I think I would have killed myself or killed someone else if I actually had to open up and look at a map while I was trying to, to travel. But that TomTom -tom was giving me information, so all I had to do is watch the roads, listen, and, and just follow its very specific directions. And if you are familiar with the GPS, either old school TomToms or your phone that talks to you, Think about the last time you used your GPS. It only gave you the amount of information that you needed for that immediate moment. Stay in the right lane. Merge right in 1,000 feet. 
You'll notice that your phone, the GPS, wasn't giving you directions for 13 miles down the road to stay in the left lane, merge left, turn left at the Arby's, right? I mean, it would have been too much information for you. It would have been too much information for me. So the Holy Spirit is similar. It's like a GPS in that it gives us information for right now. It tells me so that I'm not overwhelmed. It helps me to stay focused. Remember, we're talking about a pursuit. I want a successful pursuit. I want to get to the end of our destination. So every pursuit is incremental. The Holy Spirit will help us, guide us like a map, giving us the amount of information that we need. Now, there's a scientific term called chunking. And chunking is a word that's used to refer to the amount of information that a human brain can focus on at once. Very specifically, our brains, according to studies, can focus on seven plus or minus two things at one time. So let's just make it simple. Our brains are capable of focusing on five to nine things at once. The Holy Spirit helps us to take all of the millions of different inputs and distractions from every thought to the colors in the room, to the lights on the ceiling, to the sun in the sky. There's so many things that are, are there available and our brains will subconsciously delete those things because we will become overwhelmed. The Holy Spirit helps us to stay focused on what we need right now. Now, that brings us to the, the next valuable point. So number one, we need to know where we're going and we have been provided by God, his scriptures and his Holy Spirit to guide us. The second thing that the Holy Spirit helps us to do is to focus. Focusing is important because focus leads to progress and progress leads to happiness. Now, I doubt there's any person watching this video or here listening to my voice that wants to have a life that's unhappy. So this was worth your time right now. I'm gonna show you how to be happy progress leads to happiness. Because even though I haven't arrived at my destination, I've made progress and I've made steps toward it and it makes me feel fulfilled. So going back to chunking and staying focused, how are those tied together? We need a place to capture this information. In today's age, we've got phones and tablets and different devices, our computers, our desktops, our laptops that we can capture, write these things down. But for me, that doesn't work. What works for me is paper and pen. I carry a journal. I don't trust my memory anymore. I jot them down. I need a place to get from the chaos, the busyness, and get it down on paper, a place to capture it so that I can remain focused. If I don't, I'll, I'll lose a day or two or a week. And before you know it, I've lost focus and I'm not progressing which makes me unhappy. Now I wanna to get to what the end, I wanna to get to what God has provided for me. And so I need to do that, I need to do that, you need to do that by capturing this information. Now it's not new, new. this is scripturally sound. If you wanna look with me at Habakkuk, the prophet spends all of Habakkuk chapter one just moaning and crying and belly aching. It's quite painful to be honest with you. But if you get to through the painful part of Habakkuk chapter one, and you get to Habakkuk chapter two, verse number two, the Lord responds to him this way. He says, verse number two, then the Lord answered me and said this, write the vision and make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. Now this is important, make it plain, make it understandable. It's your notes, it's your journal, it's your device. However you wanna word it so that you understand what it means, make it plain. The key part is the second part of this verse, that he may run who reads it. That means it's there to motivate us, inspire us, keep us focused, re remind us of why we're going through this discomfort. It's gonna get me motivated to push on, push through, because there's going to be challenges as we move forward. If you've ever observed a marathon race, there's people that hold up signs that, that say, way to go, or call you out by name, and they're inspirational. There's those that are, are standing along the way holding little paper cups full of water to, to refresh you. This will help refresh you, keep us moving forward. So we need to stay focused. We do that by capturing the information. Focus leads us to progress. Progress gets us to the end. Now, the other part of focus, which is really key, this is gonna be a valuable tip for you. It's really helped me. Focus is simply this. We will find what we're looking for. Now, here's an exercise to prove this. If you're capable right now, go ahead and begin to look around the room you're in and find as many things that are brown, something brown. Just keep looking around, take a mental note. Uh, go ahead and, and look around the room, look around the outside, find as many things that are brown, something brown. You gotta, getting a, a catch for it or a flow. Now you're seeing things that are brown. Now stop. Close your eyes. Now, right now, I want you to begin to list all of the things that you saw that were blue. 
What? There wasn't blue things in the room? There wasn't blue things around you? But you didn't notice them. Why? Because you weren't searching for blue. You were searching for, bl uh, for brown. And here's a valuable key, a principle that we learned in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 7. Seek and you will find. Focus leads us to what we're, we're looking for. And I will find what I'm looking for. You will find what you're looking for. Focus is valuable. So we've covered two things already. Number one, we need to know where we're going. And we have a map to get someplace I've never been. The scriptures, the Bible. We have the GPS, the internal guiding system of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us to focus. We focus by capturing this information, keeping it before us. It inspires us to progress and happiness because we feel that we are fulfilled because we're moving forward. The third thing that we, we need to take into account is action. We need to be a people of action. James chapter 1, verse number 21. I'm reading to you from the New King James Version on this one. James 1, 21 says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Verse number 22 says, But be doers of the word, Doers, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Now let's go back to verse number 21 and look at the word wickedness. I, as I mentioned, I'm reading to you from the New King James Version, but the King James, I'm easily uh, entertained. The King James uses the word naughtiness. So it, it, if to read that in, into the context there, it says, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of naughtiness. Now that makes me laugh because I have younger children and I would, I would think it would be funny or appropriate rather to say, quit being naughty to my underage children. But if I was speaking to another adult and I said, hey, you need to lay down your naughtiness, that makes me laugh. But if you're not as easily entertained as I am, uh, just hang with me. The word naughtiness or wickedness, the root word is simply this. It's the active exercise of a vicious disposition. Now remember, we're, we're on a journey. This is a pursuit, a positive pursuit that we want to get to the end of. So just obviously, or making an obvious point, if we are making a positive change, a positive action, that would, in, that would imply that we are currently, before a change or before action, heading in a negative direction. I might have the right information, I might be able to amen the preacher. I might know what the word of God says. I might know what to do. But until I turn from that negative disposition and take action, I'm not moving anywhere. Now, what's interesting about this, verse number 22 says that we need to be doers. Say doers. Now, I, I know you're probably watching online and you're talking to yourself, but it's worth it. Speak to yourself. I need to be a doer, not a hearer only. It says for this very reason, so that we're not deceiving ourselves. Perhaps you, like me, have been around church culture long enough that we, we could fake it. We could put on the cheesy grin. Yeah, I might have had a knockdown drag out fight with my wife or kids on the way in, but I get into church, bless God, and I've got an ear-to-ear -ear grin. I can sound super spiritual if I drop sister before your name or brother before your name. I can do all of the worship expressions and, and, and I can dupe everybody in my row. I can dupe everybody in the gathering. But that's not the point of what it says here. It says if we're not doers, we're deceiving ourselves. And perhaps there's nothing greater in the realm of discouragement or demotivation than breaking a promise to yourself. At the beginning of this year, the Lord began to challenge me about getting up earlier, getting up before the phone calls, getting up before the meetings, before my children, before my wife, to have some quiet time, a time to study, a time to pray, a time to read, to meditate. And second to that, it began to challenge me about setting my alarm clock earlier and getting up when that alarm goes off. So don't just set the alarm for 5 a.m. and snooze it to 5.10, 5.20, 5.30. No, when it goes off at 5, keep that commitment to yourself. Now, I haven't been perfect, but I can tell you this. I've been getting up more often at the first part, first sound of that alarm than I have snoozing it. I'm starting with a commitment, a promise that I made to myself. And I'm so grateful that God does it this way. Something simple, subtle, like getting up when my alarm clock is set. Now that I'm building momentum, I'm, I'm carrying that into other areas. 
And if you think something subtle isn't going to affect other areas, you're wrong. It does. It builds momentum so I'm already used to telling myself, telling my body, telling my mind what to do. A few weeks ago, I had lunch with my pastor, Pastor Lee Armstrong, and he told me a story that the fact that, or that he has been running for two years now. Every night, except for Sunday night, he goes out on a three to four mile run. And he says, Phil, after two years of doing it, I still hate running. But I love telling my body what to do. It's empowered me, he said. It's encouraged me, he went on to say, that I tell my body what to do more often now. It affects every area of our lives. So let's just recap again before we go on to the next point. First one was we need to know where we're going. We have a map, a guidance system to get us there. We need to be a person of focus because we're going to find what we seek. We need to capture from the chaos, from the busyness, and have it before us. The third one, we need to be a people of action. The fourth one, and this one's really important, we need to be, or excuse me, we need to be careful on who we associate with. Who we associate with is a big deal. Let me ask you this. Uh, if you have a best friend, what would be the harm if your best friend came along and unbeknownst to you, dropped a cube of sugar in your coffee. Unless you have a problem with sugar, it's, all that's going to happen is that your, sugar, or your coffee is going to be sweet now. But let's say that same best friend came along, unbeknownst to you, and put one drop of strychnine in your cup of coffee. That could kill you. And here's the point. We must stand guard at the door of our own minds. This is a big deal. People that are around us, people that are near us, close to us, they're going to speak into our lives. Studies prove that we become uh, equivalent to our five closest friends, our catchphrases, our actions, our, our moral code. In fact, one study I read that says that we will earn between two and $3,000 annually of our closest friends. Those that are near us have a massive, massive impact in our lives. Look at Proverbs with me, chapter four, verse number 23. These first three words should really get our attention. Above all else, above all else, look at what it goes on to say, guard your heart. The word heart there is a Hebrew word that just means mind. Guard your mind above all else. Why? For everything you do flows from it. Everything that gets inside of us will determine what flows from, the, from out of us. And this happens through those that we associate with. Here, here's how the Apostle Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 33. It says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Now, we've got to be careful, and I want to make this distinction. Each week, I challenge us to go be a light in darkness. Be around people that are, are bad or don't believe just like us. Those are people that you're influencing. Those are people that I'm influencing. I'm talking about those that are close to us, our closest friends that know the real you. They know the intents and thoughts. They know, that, uh, they know the things that other people don't know. And it's closeness that they have. We need to be careful that those that we bring into our, our circles, our influences, are, are ones that are going to make a difference in our lives. And let me share a story with you in my own personal life. About a year and a half ago, I had, I had just became overwhelmed. I was discouraged. I, uh, I was struggling to sleep. There was a lot of activity. There was a lot of growth. There was a lot of things that were happening in the ministry that uh, I just wasn't handling perfectly internally. And as, a, as it went on and on, and I got less and less sleep, and I, I allowed worry to have its place. It began to have a stronghold in my life. I was ready to quit. I was ready to stop. And I got to tell you, having the right people around me, the close people around me that spoke into me, encouraged me, and that included my wife. My wife, one day, as I was walking out the door, she said, hey, before you go, before you make any announcement or tell anyone what you're thinking, I want to ask you this. Did Jesus tell you to stop? Of course he didn't, and I needed that. It penetrated right through, and then I had people that came alongside and rescued me. I'm here to tell you that if I'd been surrounded by the wrong people, my whole life could have changed. The ministry could have changed. Believers could have changed. The right people in our lives make a big difference. Let's look at another proverb. Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 20. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. We need to hang out with people that will pull us up, draw us up. And let me turn it around. We need to be that person, that quality friend that will pull people up higher, that we will speak life into people. It's not all about just getting. We also give. So we need to surround ourselves with people. So we've covered four things today. We need to understand where we're going. We need to be a person or a people of focus. 
We need to be a people of action. And we need to be around people, surrounded by people that are quality, that are going to speak into our lives. So let me conclude with a couple of final thoughts. How many can agree with me that there's a difference between common sense and common practice? In fact, I, I would say common sense isn't very common anymore. The difference between common sense, knowing what to do, and common practice, there's a gulf for many of us. We, if we want to have a successful journey, a successful pursuit, we must be a people of practice. A people of practice. We need motivation. We need motivators. We need inspiration to get us through the hard times, the difficult times, because hard times will come. Things are going to go wrong from time to time. We need to have the right well, we need to have the right things, the right people around us that will motivate us, inspire us. Let me wrap up with this final quote. Elvis Presley once said, when things go wrong, don't go with them. We need to know what to do. I hope these help. I hope these points will encourage you and inspire you. Let's close in prayers. We ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Father, help each one of us to be ones of action, ones that are of practice, not just common sense. Lord, may all the chaos that we're dealing with right now be calmed down and the things that we need to focus on. I thank you that your Holy Spirit's helping us with that even right now. That we be inspired to move, take action. Lord, if we don't have the right people around us that will equip us, speak into our lives, help bring those into our lives or at least open our eyes to see them. And may we be that person that is a good friend, that reaches out, that inspires and encourages our brothers, our sisters to continue on. Lord, help us in this moment to make the ultimate choice, to trust you, Jesus, as our Savior, to surrender all to you, the one decision for grace that changes everything. Father, we seal all of this time now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. I call you blessed. Have a great week.